Welcome back to the music of Richard Wagner. This is lecture 20. It is entitled The Ring, Part 4. Metaphor and Myth. Richard Wagner and his exact contemporary, the Italian opera composer Giuseppe Verdi, offer a fascinating contrast. They independently arrived at the same compositional conclusion at the same time, that dramatic momentum and thus continuous music must trump the traditional structures of opera. Nevertheless, their work remains fundamentally different. Verdi's Italian language operas are about real people dealing with real world issues. More often than not, they are based on historical stories and they seek to be as historically accurate as an operatic setting can be. Magic, potions, gods and trolls, supernatural beings, creatures from the Black Lagoon and their like have no place in Verdi's operas or, for that matter, 19th century Italian and French opera in general. Conceptually, Wagner's mature music dramas could not be more different from their Italian and French counterparts. Wagner wrote exactly one historical opera, Rienzi, which took place in ancient Rome. In his maturity, Wagner wrote exactly one music drama based on people behaving like people the master singers of Nuremberg. Wagner, more than any other major composer in the history of Western music, needed to talk, to spout platitudes, to convince, to dominate everyone around him. We read about his endless artistic and political monologues attended by lackeys and sycophants who wanted nothing more than to hear the master speak. As we have established, Wagner's operas and music dramas are a manifestation of the same platitudes and attitudes that Wagner talked and wrote so endlessly about. As such, Wagner's stage works were as integral a part of Wagner the person as his arms and his legs. Wagner understood implicitly that by employing myth and metaphor, he could preach his gospel in a manner that would transform reality and thus transcend time and place. What Joseph Campbell calls, quote, the no place, no time, no when, no where of the mythological age, which is here and now, unquote. Wagner came from a long line of fabulists, meaning authors of fables. In the 14th century, Dante insisted in his Inferno that the reader, quote, consider the doctrine which is concealed beneath the veil of strange verses, unquote. Wagner would have agreed completely with the words of the 15th century Florentine polymath, Giovanni Pico della Marandola, who wrote that to be universally communicated, deep knowledge must, quote, be concealed with enigmatic veils and poetical dissimulation." Unquote. On precisely these same lines, the 16th century French poet Pierre de Ronsard suggested that, quote, one must dissemble and conceal fables fitly and disguise well the truth of things with a fabulous cloak in which they are enclosed. This is precisely what Wagner believed. To quote the man, myth is true for all time, and its content, however compressed, is inexhaustible throughout the ages, unquote. We would add that it is inexhaustible because it is symbolic. Robert Donington, writing in his book, Wagner's Ring and Its Symbols, points out that, quote, if we take myth literally, we get the pleasure of a well-told story which we do not believe. If we take it symbolically, we add to this a distillation of human experience which can fairly be called, in Wagner's words, true for all time. But this truth is not usually self-evident on the surface of the myth. We accept it intuitively." Unquote. In a letter written on January 25, 1854, 
Wagner described the underlying subject matter of the ring as, quote, the depicting of reality, but to make my intention too obvious would get in the way of genuine understanding. In drama and in art generally, the way to make an effect is by putting forward something instinctive, unquote. Wagner's belief in intuition, in the magnification of instinct, lies at the core of his creative self. At another time he wrote, and again we quote, we can form no abstract idea of a thing unless we have already taken it in as an intuition, unquote. Wagner's absolute belief in the purity and power of feeling inspired by myth might seem harmless enough until we consider the possible agendas of those who would be the myth makers. Robert Gutmann addresses this when he writes, quote, Wagner's magnification of instinct, specifically German instinct, made him seek material for his dramas in myth and legend, in what he believed to be the folk's unfailing natural tendencies. This doctrine of the unerring impulses of the German folk led him into dark waters in which individualism is subordinated to a faded mass destiny and also to the perilous concept of an infallible leader as symbolic extension of the folk's wisdom. When the time came for settling the Wagner patrimony so heavily encumbered with such fraudulent items, the cost proved so appalling that not only were the man and his political beliefs cursed, but his art as well." Unquote. Siegfried, the prequel. Roughly 20 years passes between the conclusion of the Valkyrie and the beginning of Siegfried. Here's what has happened in those intervening years. When we last saw her, Sieglinda was hurrying off to the east with her twin brother Sigmund's unborn child in her womb and the pieces of his broken sword in her tote bag. She found shelter in the cave of a dwarf where she gave birth to a son and then died. The dwarf is the master metalsmith Mima, Alberic's brother, who set up shop on the surface of the earth so as to be close to the lair of Fafner the dragon and the ring of power that he so desperately covets. Mima knows he cannot best Fafner. For this, he will need a surrogate. He also knows the young man he's raised for nearly 20 years is the chosen one, and from the first Mima has planned to set Siegfried against Fafner. According to George Bernard Shaw, this is, quote, the ordinary way of the world for senile avarice to set youth to win an empire for it. There are two problems with Mima's plan. One, Siegfried hates Mima as only a rebellious post-adolescent can hate an elderly authority figure. The second problem is that Siegfried smashes to pieces every sword Mima forges for him. Simply put, no sword, no battle with the dragon. And while Mima has hidden away the fragments of no tongue that Sieglinda arrived with, he's had no success putting it back together. Finally, there's Wotan. Entirely disenchanted with his executive responsibilities, he has left Valhalla and its youth-giving golden apples. With his hair now gray and his back slightly bent, he roams the earth wearing a nondescript robe and a black slouch hat. Appropriately called the Wanderer, he seeks wisdom and to observe events he can no longer influence. Siegfried, the person. The mythological character of Siegfried was the catalytic element in Wagner's conception of the ring. Describing his conception, Wagner wrote, quote, I had always been attracted by the glorious figure of Siegfried, but only now did I realize how he could be made the hero of a drama. The poet composer has to express human values in their purest form, free of convention, unquote. The values free from convention Wagner refers to is the power of myth. However, Siegfried's mythological roots aside, he was, for Wagner, yet another embodiment of himself, a revolutionary hero, 
the fighter for a new social order that shall arise from the ruins of capitalist slavery. Having said that, the young Siegfried that we meet at the beginning of the music drama is something less than a revolutionary hero. He is, in fact, among the least likable title characters we will ever encounter. He might eventually become the world-redeeming hero, but in this music drama, he is an amoral or even premoral jerk, disrespectful, arrogant, and ungrateful. Siegfried is Wagner's devastatingly candid portrait of himself as a young man, and it is not a pretty picture. Synopsis. The plot of Siegfried is your basic coming-of-age story. Siegfried, a naive, restless, just barely post-adolescent orphan raised in the boonies, discovers his sword, you may take that any way you like, slays a giant turned dragon, beheads a Nibelung, destroys Wotan's power-giving spear, and finally walks through a ring of fire to get the girl. 